Jason Foster is the CEO of Ori Biotech, a cell and gene therapy company who have raised over $139 million in funding. He also sits on the boards of companies like Gripable, Credentially, and Oxita, and is an active angel investor too. We talk about building a company in life sciences, health tech, or biotech, and the specific challenges these have compared to other industries. We talk about not only one, but two of Jason's billion dollar health ideas. And we also discuss money, ego, happiness, and when you feel like you've made it. This is a really special one. I hope you enjoy. So Jason, would you mind telling me a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. I always say that it sort of sounds very well planned in retrospect, like there was all sort of some grand uh, red thread that I knew it was gonna happen. And I think ultimately it, it never is that way. You know, your, your career progression is often with the information you have, you make the best decision you can and you try and make it work. And then if that doesn't work, you go and do something else. So. That's the truth, but uh, when I tell it, it'll sound quite polished and, and professional. But I really started out um, when I graduated undergrad, I went to work in Washington, D.C. Uh, for working in healthcare policy. Uh, and I went as a starry-eyed, you know, 20, whatever I was, one-year-old, uh, to change the world. That's where you go, right? You go to Westminster, you go to the, the halls of power uh, to make big changes. And what I quickly learned was that politicians and policymakers are more reactive than they are proactive. They respond to the market, they respond to constituents, uh, and they weren't really driving change. They were sort of uh, on the back foot. And so got a bit disillusioned very quickly in DC. Um, this is in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, so I'm dating myself, but I was right in the middle of the dot-com uh, boom, and everybody was joining a startup, and it was the super cool thing to do. So. I started my first, I joined my first startup as a second employee uh, in, I was totally unrelated to health actually, and it fantastically blew up in 10 months, um, which which tended to happen, uh, it certainly still does now, but it tended to happen certainly at that time. Um, but learned a ton, you know, as you do, and I was young enough where it wasn't terminal, um, and then decided I wanted to get into the business side of healthcare. So went back to business school, uh, studied at Columbia, went to New York, came out working for Merck, the big pharma company, uh, who had a managed care division called Medco at that point, who essentially run pharmacy benefits. So really that was my first true healthcare job. Uh, and then became a consultant in the healthcare industry, working with pharma uh, on market access, and then uh, moved actually to my hometown. So I was living in New York uh, City that whole time. So for five years, I got married at that point, and my wife and I decided that we'd probably move out of the city and maybe uh, think about having a child. So we moved to my hometown of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and I joined a startup pharmaceutical company. Uh, I was one of the first five members of the management team there in a business that was focused in addiction medicine, actually, kind of un very underserved uh, area of medicine. And we built that business over 10 years to 1,100 people. We were in 37 countries and eventually carved that business out of its parent company and listed it on the LSE in 2014. So uh, that is how, as you can tell by my funny accent, I'm an American, but have lived in the, in the UK for 12 years. Um, so my wife and I are both American and sound like this. My kids are both basically British and have very posh British accents and play strange sports like cricket that I don't really understand. Um, but uh, that's how we ended up in the UK. It was sort of halfway through that journey. The company sent me to London to start the European operation. And as you'll appreciate, you know, working in a startup or a scale up uh, is very, very different than working in a mature publicly listed company that's in, you know, 37 countries with a thousand employees. So at that point, I decided um, maybe I would go back to my roots and try and work with startups again and, and really start to build things. Um, when you're managing a publicly traded company, it's a very different animal. So in 2016, left that business that we'd helped build over 10 and a half years and started working with startups as an advisor, as a consultant, working with uh, private equity and venture capital as well, uh, investing a bit as an angel. So I think I mentioned to you, we, I have a portfolio of 13 companies that I have invested in. I sit on the board of four of them, including Ori, which we'll talk about later, I'm sure. And uh, so I get kind of a, a unique perspective as an operator, you know, CEO of a venture-backed company, Series B venture-backed company, as a director for other health tech companies and also as an investor and advisor to uh, to PE and VC. Kind of seeing it from, from multiple angles, I think, is uh, is, a, is a good perspective to be able to add value uh, if we try to. So that's kind of where I landed now. That's 2016. Um, still doing some of those things. I met the team at Ori Biotech in 2018 as a potential investor. 
and Ori works in the cell and gene therapy space, which we can talk more about, but it's a super exciting area of medicine where we take personalized, tailored medicines for an individual, and they're often made of living cells. So they're living medicines that we have to uh, somehow figure out how to manufacture and deliver back to the patient, but they have incredible potential to cure cancer and rare disease and other things. So very, very exciting company, and uh, I decided to join full-time in 2019, and we've been growing that business ever since. So that's kind of a little bit of the journey over the last 20-odd years or so. What was your goal when you started out? Was it to kind of change health? Was it to make a load of money? Like, what, what, what were your intentions? Yeah, I got into healthcare really because I figured if I was going to expend my effort in a direction, I should do it in a, in a way that was at least somewhat, uh, had some value beyond just making money. Um, so, of course, we all have to make money. It's part of the part of the gig, part of the way we keep score, and part of the way we provide for ourselves and our futures. But I think ultimately, you know, I had the opportunity to go and sell toilet cleaner uh, within the same business that I built that pharmaceutical company in uh, and decided that toilet cleaner wasn't nearly as exciting as uh, as healthcare and, and medicine. So I've always been in healthcare, you know, since business school for that 20 odd years. And, um, you know, it's, it's palpable the impact that the businesses that I've worked in, you know, in, in addiction medicine, I said, and some of these other businesses, I work with a a neuro rehabilitation business called Grippable, which is doing some exciting stuff in uh, in stroke rehab. Uh, some exciting other companies like Ori that we were talking about. So it's easy to get out of bed in the morning and 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 go to work and try and work in these exciting companies that are trying to make a difference for patients. In your story, was there an inflection point where you felt like you made it, or things started just working for you? Because you know, not 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 to be like critical or anything, but like early on in your story, it doesn't sound like you're doing anything crazy crazy. And then at some point, it looks like something happened like what was that point i think the the success that we had with what's now in divier that business that i started with and we grew to a thousand people um was really an inflection point of seeing a business go from essentially a startup into a successful sort of going concern um and i think the red thread for you know for success in my view is taking risks it's really not being afraid to kind of try something new or go to a young company and when my wife and I were making the decision of whether or not to move to London. We just bought a house. My wife was five months pregnant. We had a two-year-old living, you know, a half a mile from my parents down the street in Richmond, Virginia, my hometown. It was all very comfortable. Um, but, you know, we, we asked ourselves, are we ever going to regret moving to London for two years or three years or however long it is? Uh, and we decided, no, we wouldn't. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the, you always regret the things you don't do much more than the things you actually, you know, the leaps you actually take. And so a willingness to take risk, a willingness to kind of try and capture an opportunity, make it happen. And then when I left that business in 2016, it was a little bit um, nerve wracking. I mean, I had two young children, live in London, very expensive place. Uh, I didn't have a guaranteed income of what, you know, what would happen next. And I bet on myself. I was able to get a little bit of a severance package from my employer and said, well, if the being an independent consultant doesn't work for me, then I'll go find a job in the salt mines and do what I have to do. Uh, to, to earn money. But I think ultimately betting on myself, taking a bit of risk, trying to find the opportunities, going after your passion. These are things, this is kind of the recipe that has worked for me at least uh, over the last 25 years. When you're taking risks, there's purely stupid risks. <laughs> and then it looks like smart people take smart risks. Uh. And there seems to be something about kind of taking a risk with an asymmetric benefit and maybe a bit of a capped downside. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about your risk-taking formula? If there's anything you do to mitigate those or anything you uh, specifically look for? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting insight. I think you're right is that you're, you're taking calculated bets. You're not just going and playing in traffic or something. It's sort of <laughs> I'm trying to make the most of, a, of an opportunity. But, you know, I had seen, looking at Ori as an example, I had seen 3,000 or so health tech opportunities over the course of two and a half or three years. I'd invested in some of them, you know, 10 or 12. I think my portfolio is at 13 now. Uh, I'd worked with some some investors uh, and, you know, found a way to kind of make those relationships work and pay the bills. But I hadn't ever thought about mis- maybe going back into operational role. Um, it wasn't necessarily what I was looking for. But when I met, saw, met the ORA team, saw the opportunity, the incredible science happening in cell and gene, you know, cures for cancer uh, and rare diseases, just incredible. Um, I just said, what the heck? You know, it's sort of, it seems if I can bet on myself again and say, I think we can go out and raise money based on the story and the data that the company has and the opportunity. And I said to Farland, I'll, I'll help you do this. Farland's the co-founder of Ori. 
I said, I'll help you raise money. And if we raise money, then we'll figure out what happens next. But I sort of just went at risk. I saw an opportunity uh, and, you know, the downside in your, in your kind of, you know, setup was the downside was basically capped. You know, I had a other consulting uh, jobs that were keeping the lights on and putting food on the table. And I said, if it works, then we'll do something great. And if it doesn't, then I'll do something else. So I think, again, it's picking your spots and not, you know, as you said, not not taking crazy risks, um, but trying to mitigate the downside and, and look for opportunities that could re- have big potential and be very satisfying. You know, it's not always things you're looking for, what can you make the most money doing? You know, potentially it's what you can get the most value out of or get the most gratification out of doing. I was very lucky that, you know, I'm very lucky in general, having been born in the Western world, you know, my parents paid, paid for my education. I think all these things started me out on good footing and, and have been able to try and maximize it from there. I think there are two approaches to trying to make it. Well, there's probably more. But one is to just kind of go out into the world and create value and do stuff you're good at and get better at it. And then another approach is to like directly chase money. Mm. Um, what What's your feeling there? Like uh, which approach works better? Which one have you gone for? Like what do you think? I'm trying to think back. I don't think I've ever uh, made a change or, you know, had a job, taken a role just for the money. I mean, I think... I certainly, there was this inflection point in business school when, I, because I went to Columbia, there was a lot of investment bankers and consultants that were sort of taking a two-year hiatus before going back to, you know, Wall Street or wherever it was they came from. And that was an, that was a path that was open to me. And that's sort of a, you know, I was 28 at the time, you know, you, you sacrifice 10, 12 years of your life and you're working like a dog, but you come out, you know, with tens of millions of dollars in the bank. That was a path, and and I had friends that went down that path, and now they're they're in good shape. You know, basically retired, doing whatever they want. But you know, I wasn't willing to to sacrifice that ten years. You know, I figured I may be missing out on some of my kids. You know, early years, and so I think it's you know, um, it's not always a binary decision. You know, hopefully you can find a way to earn a, a good living and support your family and yourself doing something you love. And I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, again, taking some of those calculated risks along the way. The amount of projects and things you do gives me a little bit of anxiety because I'm basically a doctor and I do this podcast and then try and, you know, friends, family and a bit of exercise. And that's that's me spent. That's my bandwidth done. Yeah. Um, basically, healthy eating and stuff goes out the window. I live on Monster Munch and uh, Monster Energy drinks. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to ask you, can you, in a really kind of, you know, basic way, just explain to me when you're doing like a hundred different things, what does that actually look like? Does that mean that you're spending an hour a week on everything? Does that mean that some stuff's just on the back burner? You put an initial bit of work in and it just runs itself. And then secondly, I'd be interested in, I've heard this framework that as you become more and more uh, accomplished or get further into your career, you end up saying no to more opportunities than you say yes to. When you're very young, you can say yes to everything. When you're older, you say no to. So I'd be quite curious to hear how you've decided or landed on the number of projects you do. Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's an old adage about if you want something done, uh, give it to someone who's busy. You know, I think the the idea that you know, it, I don't I don't believe that productivity is a fixed pie. Obviously, time is a fixed pie, but you can be very productive in the hours you choose to work if you sort of keep a cadence. You know, you keep yourself busy and don't get sucked into scrolling, you know, TikTok or whatever people do these days. Um, sound like an old man. Um, so I think you know, I've been tried to be very selective, as you said, on what I really dedicate my time to. So I sit on the board of four companies. So Ori, uh, a company called Credentially, which is in the clinician credentialing space, trying to solve some of the staffing challenges in the UK and elsewhere. We talked about Grippable and then a company called Oxida, which is actually based in, uh, its operations are based in Canada. But those were all portfolio companies that I really hit it off with the founders and thought I could help. And so, you know, I haven't, I've turned down a number of board roles or other types of roles where I just feel like I, I was on a board that I actually stepped off of because I'm just like, it's not working. You know, I'm not adding value. And, you know, you guys are better off, you know, having somebody else sitting in this chair. So I think good self-awareness helps. What am I good at? What am I not good at? Am I making headway? Am I adding value or not? Uh, and I try and be, I, I don't do a lot of things. I, I have my two kids and my wife. So family time, I try and work out in the mornings or else it doesn't happen. And then I've got work. I don't have a bunch of other things that I do uh, that are sort of this long list of, of uh, hobbies or anything like that. So I think you need to kind of pick your spots. And uh, for me, the the idea of work-life balance is kind of a misnomer. I think it's about work-life integration. How do you put all the pieces together of what's important to you? 
in a way that makes sense for you. So generally what I'll do is get up, I don't know, 6.30, 6-ish, help the kids get out the door to school, go to the gym 8 to 9 or be back at the desk at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, run till 5 or 5.30 or whatever, take a couple hours, do dinner, you know, spend some time with the family, and then maybe do a bit more, you know, between 9 and midnight if that's what needs to be done. So trying to fit all those pieces together, but if there's a football match or a netball match, you know, at three o'clock on a Wednesday, you just schedule it in. I'm just not going to be available then. I'm going to go do that instead. So it's really about being ruthless with your prioritization and your time and making sure that you're not saying uh, or allowing other people to uh, dictate your where you spend your time. You know, there's there was a, we were actually just went through this with my daughter who's going through GCSEs and there's these time management sort of hacks that the teachers and the and the tutors give them is, you know, you schedule all your things into the week that you have to do. Those are your sort of blocks that, so it could be working out, it could be whatever the things are that you have to do. And then you schedule all the other things you have to do around that. And in that way, you don't find yourself being blown in the wind in a direction or not uh, that you don't want to go. And those those things that are critical to, to do, uh, you make time for them. So that's one of the hacks I've kind of adopted recently. Uh, but I still say yes to too many things. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, faultless in, you know, I, I love to try and help. And, you know, so I try and mentor companies when I can. If a founder reaches out to me and says, hey, you know, we'd love to get your insight, I'll read their deck and I'll give them some feedback. But uh, it does eat into the sleep a little bit, but it's all, again, about priorities and, and what, how you want to spend your time. I want to ask you a bit about your role in, say, coaching founders and generally what you've picked up on coaching and mentoring mm-hmm. people. Uh, for a bit of context, there was this really good article in the Harvard Business Review called The Feedback Fallacy, and that talked about the way we give feedback is wrong. So it said that we think of it as almost like a glass. So there's a founder, they're kind of a glass half full, and if they're doing something wrong, we take some of the water out and then we put some of the right water back in. And they said that's the wrong way to think of it. It's more like a uh, like a tree is growing or a branch is growing, and you've got to nurture the bits of the tree that are growing well. and they ba- the, the conclusion they basically drew was that negative feedback doesn't really work. You've got to just nurture what's good yeah. and everything else will fall into place. I wondered what your opinion was just in general on coaching and mentoring founders and what you thought about in general just giving feedback to people if you've learned anything on that. Yeah, it's a great question. I'd like to read that article actually if you'd send it to me. Um, yeah, of course. I think the the analogy that I often use and think about is coaching is about performance and the idea is that a coach has a position of trust with the person that they're coaching. So if you know, if someone's coaching me and I know that they have my best interests in mind, we have a, we have a relationship of trust, then I'm going to be much more open to the feedback and the, the challenges and the advice that they're giving me. If I'm concerned that potentially they're trying to make me look bad or, or you know, their motives are other than you know, altruistic, other than pure, then I'm going to be much more reticent and much more sort of guarded in the way that I sort of accept or, or take feedback on board. So first of all, feedback is built on trust uh, and coaching is is fundamentally about trust and feedback. So I'd work very hard on those relationships to live up to, to being worthy of being trusted um, and to build rapport with those people that I'm in that relationship with. And you also look across, you know, as a, someone who is being coached, you need to be open to taking it, you know, taking it on board. You know, you think about the, the adage around Tiger Woods, best golfer ever. He had a coach, Butch Harmon, who helped him, you know, get to his peak performance. So no matter how good you are at something, there's always other people who have alternative perspectives or experiences or value to add to you, even if you're the best in the world at whatever it is you're doing. So being open to coaching and seeking out those people that can add value. Um, again, it's sort of like, I don't, I don't take on every opportunity to coach someone um, because I may not be the right person. I may not be, I may not have value to add. So it's really kind of, it's a two-way street for sure. And um, we're, we're working very, very hard at Ori in particular uh, to build a culture around feedback and trust. So these, are, these things also have cultural differences um, from the geographies that we grow up in, the kind of cultures. So you know, I always joke that the U.S. and the U.K. are two countries separated by a common language. Um, having lived here for 12 years, I've seen both cultures in action. Now I have both passports, and so I'm sort of neither nor rather than both and. But um, 
as an American, you can get away with being a bit more straightforward. You can get away with a bit more being a bit more blunt. You are known for sort of telling you like it is. Um, and you know, my my British friends and colleagues sometimes communication can be a bit more circumspect, shall we say? Um, so knowing these things about you know the cultural differences in the way we've been grown up and the culture we've grown up in uh, also helps in you know opening up the lines of communication and. So we're working hard with our team at Ori to say, you know, I'm the CEO and I want feedback from you. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I want you to put your hand up and say, Jason, I don't agree. Or Jason, I don't think we're doing the right thing. Or Jason, I don't understand. You know, I want to have that level of discussion. Usually in an organization, the feedback flows one direction. Down. You know, is your boss telling you all the things you did wrong? That is not the kind of feedback that we're open to. So I think it's really it built on trust, built on uh, a desire to help everybody improve uh, and to improve communication. And that's a pretty good start uh, on that front. When I want some coaching, mentorship advice, I tend to reach out to people like yourself, really, like through this podcast, like I'll ask you those yeah. questions. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, you you get some kind of 360 feedback from your position as well. But when you're the CEO of Ori and you're looking to speak to someone who's basically done it all before, maybe a bit ahead of you, what do you do exactly? Like, do you hire an executive coach? Do you send cold DMs to the, to the CEO of Pfizer? Like, what what's your game plan? I think the... Uh, LinkedIn is kind of a funny one. So LinkedIn is my social media of choice professionally. And then I'm old enough to think Facebook is okay as well. So you sort of see your friend's pictures from college and, you know, the, of their kids and whatever. So those are kind of the two things that I do. But from a professional basis, building and investing in your network. So oftentimes someone will reach out and say, hey, like just this happened just this morning. Like, hey, do you mind talking to this person? She's, you know, looking to switch careers or she wants to know about this thing. Uh, and I'll say, sure, I'll spend, you know, 10 minutes chatting with her about, and if I can help, I will, you know, try and add value to the conversation. So building out that network and being known as someone who can add value is willing to add value and willing to connect, I think is, is, uh, is the start. And so I actually, um, one of the analogs I think is appropriate for Ori and what we're trying to do is Illumina and what they did in the sequencing market and obviously a fantastically successful company. At one point, I don't know what it is worth now, but it was worth $50 billion um, doing amazing things in the gene sequencing or DNA sequencing market, building out whole new use cases for biopharma. Uh, and I wanted to ch chat with Jay Flatley. I thought, you know, he'd be a super interesting person to introduce myself to and, and get to know. And a person that I knew knew him and he int uh, she introduced us and Jay and I had a nice chat. Um, I wanted to get him involved in Ori. He politely declined because uh, he was too busy. And so as you said, you know, being judicious about your time and the things you have to do. Uh, but it was a great conversation hearing about the early days of Illumina and the kind of things that he as a CEO really was focused on. You know, I learned a lot in, in an hour. So I think for the most part, asking for help is a great way uh, to build rapport. You know, showing someone the saying, hey, I'd really value your expertise on this particular issue. We're struggling with this challenge. You know, would you spend half an hour with me just having this, having a conversation about it, people will most often want to help. I very rarely had people just be like, no, I don't want to connect. No, I'm not willing to help you. It almost never happens. So it's really, you just have to be brave enough to ask the question. Uh, and for the most part, people will try and help if they can. Uh, that's been my experience. And if I can kind of return the favor karmically out to the universe uh, and do the same, then I'll do that. Uh, certainly if I can squeeze it into the, into the schedule. I'm guessing that 90% of the cold outreach that comes to you is basically in one way or other wanting something from you, wanting you to do something, wanting you to connect them to someone, wanting you to invest. Does that ever piss you off? <laughs> I do get... No one wants to just say hi and no, ask exactly, about a day, yeah. right? I, I do get frustrated with the uh, the cold outreach on, you know, selling me software, offshoring software services or R&D tax credits or, you know, it's just all this stuff is... We're, we're, so it's funny because I, I, for branding purposes, I've on LinkedIn, put Jason C. Foster, because there's way too many boring Jason Fosters out there. So it's Jason C. Foster. Um, and in the in the box uh, where you put your name in LinkedIn, I put Jason C. because there was no middle initial box and then Foster. So if it's kind of a bot reaching out to me, it'll be like, hello, Jason C. How are you today? You know? <laughs> and so it's an easy way to be like, delete. You know, I don't care. I, I actually responded to one person that kept annoying me. I, I don't want to talk to your bot. Like, please leave me alone. Um, but it's, uh, it is kind of one of those things where for genuine outreach and particularly, I mean, this is why, you know, people give advice to founders to say, you know, get a warm intro. If you're looking to, to talk to investors, find someone that they know 
find someone that's connected to them and get them to introduce you. It just cuts through all the noise and all the clutter. And, and it's probably not fair to, un, you know, first time founders who maybe don't have as big a network, but it's just a way to cut through the noise. Um, there's so much noise out there in the world and you read, I don't know how many emails you get a day. I get hundreds. Uh, and you know, maybe only 20 or 30 are actually worth engaging with. So it's sort of, you have to really be disciplined about, you know, the kind of things that you respond to or react to or spend time on. So I think that's, you know, kind of a hack is the definitely reach out to people, find a warm intro if you want to, you want to actually get a response. Um, but don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask them, say, Hey, can I buy you a coffee? I'd love to pick your brain on this. You know, I, a lot of when I left, um, when I left in Divier, so when I left that company that I built over 10 years, I really knew no one in the startup ecosystem because I had been heads down building a business for 10 years and, you know, six in the UK and didn't have any clue about what was happening. And I said, well, you know, how am I going to get out there and sort of meet people? And so I just started with a few people I know and I'd take them out for coffee and I'd say, who should I go chat with next? And they say, well, talk to these two people. And then I'd call them and say, let's go have coffee. And then we'd say, who, who's the next two people I should chat with? That's how I met James Samaro. I mean, that's most of my network uh, came through just that outreach. I got involved with an organization called Tech London Advocates, which is a nonprofit that's supporting the tech eco ecosystem in London. I uh, started to, you know, volunteer to work with an early stage accelerator called Deep Science Ventures uh, and just started to get out there, you know, just try and add value if I could and and keep, you know, building that network. And, and that's a way, I think, to show the world that you're, you know, you're out there, you're open to connections, you're open to, to people uh, when they need help, but also um, asking for help to try and build rapport and see if you can uh, find mutually beneficial relationships out there in the world. That's that's where really where actually every one of the, the opportunities that I've had in the last six years, which is almost seven years now, since I left that company, came out of that. They came out of my network uh, and from people I know saying, hey, you should meet this person, and then an opportunity arises where I can connect them somewhere else, and that leads to something good. So... Just be out there. Put yourself out there, and generally, people are nice and receptive and want to help. The unusual beat of your story, or one of them, is that you were a marketer, right? And that's what got you mm -hmm. to your role today, or that, that's a bit of an unusual journey. Um, can you fill me in on that a bit? And then also, I'd be curious to know how that background has basically colored uh, your view of the world as a CEO now, like, have you taken any particular learnings from that? Is there anything you think you might do differently to other leaders in the space because of your background? Yeah, great question. I think, um, so I studied marketing in business school and I really, um, I love the psychology of marketing, why people make the decisions they make, whether it's buying a decision or, you know, whether they buy this company or they partner with that organization. It's super interesting, the, the psychology behind um, human decisions. And so marketing was a very kind of strategic and interesting area for me to study. And so when I graduated out of business school, went to work as a marketer in the marketing function at Merck Medco. And then ultimately when I signed on with Indivier, I was a brand manager. So I was you know, running marketing for that organization. And in pharma, it's not that unusual for people to come through the commercial track uh, and end up in senior leadership. So you go through marketing or sales. Our CEO at the time actually was the former VP of marketing. So it seemed like a reasonable, a reasonable approach to get to the point where you could be an executive. Um, and I just really enjoyed it, really enjoyed marketing and did that for, from, I graduated in business school from 03 and I got my first general management role in 2012. So it was nine years of pure marketing and kind of marketing leadership roles. Uh, and I think it's great training. It's very strategic. Uh, it's it's very people oriented. You know, a lot of people want to be CEOs for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I think what you don't realize about being a CEO or being a senior manager is that most of your day is spent on people. You're recruiting people. You've got people issues. Your policies around people. You're communicating. A lot of what you do all day. I mean, this is true for anyone, right? So we've come to default to written communication as one of the primary, if not the primary means in which we convey information. So it might be a text message, it might be a WhatsApp, it might be an email. Um, I bet 70 or 80% of our communication is probably written rather than verbal, which is a difference from, you know, years ago. But communication is incredibly important. Being able to communicate clearly and concisely and be compelling 
is something you learn as a marketer. You know, you, you have to write compelling copy. You're writing, you know, you're communicating with the world in marketing. And that skill set is absolutely transferable to any sort of leadership role. So I think that's probably what kind of the path, where the path took me from marketing into management. But I also wanted to to get that that general management experience, you know, managing a P&L and looking at operations and looking at finance and some of these other pieces that I hadn't done before. So in 2020, 2012, when I got that uh, opportunity, um, it was great. I managed a team of 40 people all over Europe. So we had the UK, Ireland, the Nordic countries, and the Baltic countries. Uh, and we talked about culture earlier. The culture in the Nordics is extremely flat. It's extremely open. You know, the people hit you between the eyes with it. It's much, much more kind of American in the way they operate um, compared to more hierarchical cultures across Europe. And great education for an American who'd sort of come over to uh, to live in London a couple of years prior to be in, you know, one week you'll be in Copenhagen and then you'll be in uh, Helsinki and then you'll be in Dublin and then maybe Munich and Milan and, and just seeing all those cultures in action and the differences. Um, there's a great book called... Uh, the Culture Map by Aaron Meyer. I don't know if you know Aaron. She wrote, uh, co-wrote No Rules Rules with Reed Hastings, uh, which is a great book about uh, Netflix, which has a very unique culture. Um, but she writes about all of these kind of, there's six or eight or 12 domains in which culture is measured and how, you know, some of them are obvious or maybe, you know, people think, okay, Germany might have more structured processes than Spain or whatever, just to generalize. But there's so much nuance there about what the way you influence in different countries. And um, it's a great read if you're working across cultures. But it's these kinds of lessons that you learn as a as a marketer and then as a manager. It's all about people. It's all about how do you relate, how do you motivate, how do you communicate. Uh, and doing those things well or has been a, a secret of success, I think. We're talking about cultures and, I guess, different styles. And um, I think to a degree, different levels of extroversion versus introversion as well goes into it where... The uh, typical American is, I think, heavily skewed towards extroversion, at least compared to the typical Brit. Um, I've got this kind of counter to the current narrative theory that basically just being an extrovert is just way better in most situations, especially in business and commerce. There's been a couple of books. I think one was called something like The Power of Introversion or The Power of Introverts that's done the rounds. And there's been a lot of narrative on how basically being an introvert and being an extrovert are basically equal and they're two different approaches and both are as, as good. But I'm, in my own self, I'm trying to develop just becoming more extroverted. Uh, if business is a people's game, then I, I don't see why being introverted could ever be a benefit. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Agree, disagree? What do you think? Yeah, I do have some thoughts. What do you think I am? Um, I think you are definitely extroverted, but maybe deep down you're actually an introvert. So in the, I mean, the only measurement I've ever done or seen is in the Myers-Briggs um personality typing and I'm an introvert actually so but just close to the line so uh, my understanding of it is introversion or introverts get their energy from being by themselves and extroverts get their energy from being in crowds or with people or interacting so you can often tell if I'm out at an event and I've been talking to a lot of people my energy starts to wane as I go sort of further in the day and then I need to go sort of meditate and read a book for a while to get the kind of fill the cup back up um, but I'm obviously easily able to flex into extroversion and, you know, because of maybe because I'm American, maybe because of the roles I've been in. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's an asset being able to flex your style, flex your personality, get away from necessarily your comfort zone. If you're horribly shy and introverted, it's going to be extremely difficult to flex to a, you know, social gregarious out, out there person probably. But, you know, using those muscles, stretching it within within the range in which you're comfortable, um, I think is hugely beneficial. You know, putting yourself out there, you know, sometimes I'm sure everyone goes through this, you know, you know you'll, you'll be at the end of the day or be late in the week and you're like, oh, I really don't want to go to that event. I just don't, you know, I've, I've been out all week and I'm tired. And, and then when you end up, you know, saying, okay, I'll just go, it'll be fine. And then you go and you meet someone great and you have a great conversation. You're like, oh, I was, I'm glad I did that. You know, it's sort of just putting yourself out there and saying, you know, it's easy to sit at home on the couch and watch TV. You can do that anytime. Absolutely. But it's really the, the people that matter and, and the, the, the people that when you meet interesting people and you have interesting conversations, that's what gives you the juice. That's what gives you the energy, the, you know, I mean, I think we spend may, way too much time sucked into the matrix as I call it it's sort of like the you know you see all the time walking down the street people staring at their mobile phones 
sitting on a bench. Um, you know, there's, there's the whole world is in our pocket, which is not a good thing. It's incredibly distracting from actually the things that matter, which are those human relationships. It's the human relationships that make the difference in our quality of life. And there's lots of studies to prove that, um, that, you know, actually the number one, I don't know if it was the predictor of happiness or longevity or both for men is the quality of their marital relationship. Um, and there's a 70 year Harvard study where they followed a group of students. Uh, that was the number one predictor, but it's the human, human beings are more social creatures. We're used to sitting around a campfire, telling stories to each other and being with other human beings. Um, so, you know, as much, as much as you can do of that or tolerate of it and keep your energy up, I think it's worth, worth putting yourself out there. I came across an interesting article that said that loneliness was worse than smoking for your uh, longevity. longevity. So yeah, totally agree. Mm -hmm. Um, do you just on the topic of relationship building specifically in um like a, a business setting is there anything you've learned about you know when you meet people making a good impression maintaining that relationship creating your network um all of those things is there are there any any things that you think that you do that work well for you yeah there's a friend and mentor longtime mentor of mine um called adrian norton he and i worked together uh, for many years he's a, a student of uh, NLP, uh, neuro, neuro linguistic programming, I think it's called, but it's a lot of it's the study of human beings and why they do what they do. Um, one of the shorthands that he's taught me over many, many years is um, people who are like each other, like each other. So there's a, this idea of, you know, have you ever been in, met someone for the first time? Like, oh, where are you from? Oh, where'd you go? To, where'd you go to college? Oh, I know somebody who went there. Do you know so and so? So you are seeking commonality. We are seeking a shared experience a shared bond so people who are like we're trying to increase sameness increase the how similar we are and decrease our differences this is about building rapport this is the science behind building relationships and, and sort of engaging with people um so finding things that are being open you know being friendly um i, I have also seen many studies around uh people will rate you as a very intelligent interesting fantastic wonderful person if you ask them a lot of questions about themselves because people like to talk about themselves and it's easy. And so, you know, you can be a great date if you're out on a, on a date by asking your date a lot of questions about themselves because people are very comfortable talking about themselves most often. And, and it's a, uh, it's not a topic that's controversial or, so there's these kind of tricks for us introverts to, uh, to make it through, navigate these uh, social situations, which are, you know, I'm, I'm naturally curious and interested in people. And, um, I think that's a, maintaining that posture, maintaining that interest and asking good questions and listening, active listening. These are all good, good skills to learn uh, as we, as we move forward, both in our personal and professional lives. I want to selfishly just ask you a question or like a bit of an anxiety I've been having in my own career, which is essentially that when I look to people I admire, they tend to be people who are founders, people, people like yourself running big things, having a big impact, running the show. And that's always something I've aspired to do. But then when I look at my natural tendencies, what I'm good at, what I gravitate towards, it seems to be more towards uh, marketing and content. Like this podcast, for example, this is something I am uh, like to think I'm good <laughs> at, but it's not something that's involved start, you know, making a company or, or doing something that would traditionally be considered like a sexy founder type yeah. fit. Um, and I guess my question to you, I, I don't know exactly what the question is, but do you think that anxiety is like f fair to have because i think there's a big kind of narrative it especially runs in tech circles that like like hey man these are the founders these are the people building stuff and everyone else like th th like they're, they're nothing they're yeah. just crap they're just like on the sidelines like all these investors like what have they ever built like it's the founders that matter like do you have any kind of general thoughts on that anxiety i do uh, having you know sort of lived through now a couple let's call them entrepreneurial sort of boom times you know 2000 and mm. People could, you know, sell a sock pocket puppet for $2 billion. And, you know, there's, there's these kind of stories about these really dynamic founders. And um, there is a cult around entrepreneurship and founders and sort of, you know, the the sex appeal of starting a business and raising VC capital. And, um, and I don't think it's well-founded, to be honest. I think, you know, being a founder is not for everyone. and Or being a, you know, startup CEO is not for everyone. And it's really important to, that there are many, many other valuable things you can do other than that, you know, I think because you and I probably travel in a lot of the same circles, this is the kind of, these are the people we meet, this is the lines we hear, um, those are the stories we get told. But, you know, 
when I was growing up, there was no one that was a found that, that it wasn't even a thing. People were lawyers, they were doctors, they worked in companies for 20 years and got their, you know, gold pen at the end or whatever. Um, that was success. And so it's, I think it's really how you frame and, 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 uh, think about what's successful. I mean, having a successful podcast that entertains and, and educates people, that's, that's a great success. And it, it, it's really about kind of framing what success looks like for you. And I think one of the many things I respect about Farland, the founder of Ori. Um, he's an academic. He was an academic at, AC, at UCL, very deep expert in bioprocessing, uh, very creative. He's an innovator by nature. He likes to, to create stuff. Uh, when we were talking about, we, we'd sort of gone down the road of the financing and uh, for Ori, the, the seed round in 2019, and I said, you know, I don't really care what role I have. Like, this is where I think my skills are. This is where I think your skills are. Let's kind of match him up and figure out what's got to get done. And, you know, you tell me what you want. And then he went away. I've thought about it over the weekend and he came back and said, I want you to be the CEO. And when you're a founder of a business, the C there's quite a lot of ego tied up with the, the CEO title. Um, but when you look at the day-to-day -day activities of a CEO, sometimes that's not best suited for your skill set as a founder or your skill set as a scientist or as a teacher or whatever the things are your background is. So I think it's it's really important to be honest with yourself and self-aware about what what gets you excited. What do you love doing? Because if it's not making 150 cold calls to investors and you know dealing with HR issues and worrying about you know f the the, the uh, balance sheet, that's a lot of what the CEO does. I mean, it sounds sexy, but it's not that sexy. You know, a lot of it's just blocking and tackling. Like you just got to keep the machine ticking over, and you got to put the right structures in place, and you got to you know, build a great culture. And so it's really important that you're self-aware about what, what you love. And if it is those things, then great, you know, go, go run after it. But for a lot of people, it's not going to be those things. And you can have a great career. You can have a great, you can be part of a great startup, but not be the CEO. I mean, I think that's the, that's the takeaway for me. It's really finding the right spot for you and what you love and what you're good at. Can we talk about ego, perhaps your own ego, your journey with your ego and your current yeah. ego? Uh, because one of the like reflections or thinkings I've been having as I uh, progress is that uh, my ego is getting a little bit bigger. But I think that in some ways that's a good thing because I think it gives you confidence, crucially. So I think although it gets a bad rap to have a big <laughs> ego, it also makes you very confident and it makes you self-assured and helps you go out there and do yeah. stuff. Uh, so I've been trying to nurture my own ego actually a, a mm. bit more. Um, but what have your thoughts been around ego? Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. I think confidence and arrogance are, is, a, is a fine line. Um, and it's really about, for me, is kind of who do you focus on? Am I focused on self? Or am I focused on others? And I really want the others uh, that I'm in touch with, the CEOs that I work on their boards or the people that I work with at Ori, I feel as though I want to provide kind of servant leadership. My goal is to help them be successful. And if they're successful, then I know I'll be successful. And sometimes I've had to check my own ego at the door and say, you know what, I'm, you know, I need to step back or I'm not the best person for that. Or, you know, you get a ping of jealousy if someone else gets the spotlight for a second or whatever those things are that, you know, you sort of, you know, we all are human beings at our core and, you know, we're not going to always have the intellectually right emotional response, you know. So, you know, I certainly struggle a bit at times with what's the right balance of, you know, being out in front as a leader and supporting the team as a leader. You know, I, I think my more natural tendency is a, as, as, as a, a bit of servant leadership. So um, I have in the past been accused of being arrogant um, and you can have, I think, confidence mistaken for arrogance, um, but it's a fine line. And so I think it's really important to be, again, you know, that EQ, that self-awareness, knowing what, what you're really good at, what you really love, what you, what's gonna where those lines are drawn, uh, and being very sensitive to the people around you. This is mi mixed up in communication. This is mixed up in good question asking and good listening. It's do you really care about the people? Or are you just asking the question because you know you're supposed to ask it? You know these kinds of things will be found out quite easily. Um, and so you have to be genuine. You know your genuine self, and that's where I think the uh, the difference between confidence and arrogance may be found somewhere in there. Um, if you are genuinely interested in the people that you work with and that uh, you're the people that you partner with, I think that sort of self-confidence to move the ball forward uh, will be well received as opposed to being seen to sort of put myself in front and, you know, I want it to be all about me. But 
it's a fine line. It's a fine line for sure. And particularly for introverts, I find that sometimes we aren't comfortable being out front, being in the spotlight. We have to put our, take ourselves out of our comfort zone uh, and do that interview or have that conversation or go up to that person and say hello when you really don't feel like it um, because it's good for us and it helps you know flex those muscles a bit. An interesting thought I've seen on this is Adam Grant's writing on disagreeable yeah. givers, where it's like being agreeable is kind of like being a yes man, being nice to everyone, and then being disagreeable is being a bit more uh, willing to challenge the status quo or say what you yeah. really think. And then if you marry that with being someone whose intentions are pure and you're there to kind of help people and, and, and serve them, then being the disagreeable giver is potentially a good way to square that, that square that circle. Yeah, I like that. I like some of his stuff and that's an interesting way to put it. I've read a couple of his books, but yeah, I, I haven't ever heard that framework, but it is, I think it's apropos for sure. Why are you doing this podcast, by the way? Because arguably it's a bit of a waste of time for you. <laughs> so I'm just, I, I'm just, and, and you do a few of these as well. So just, I'm just curious, like, why, why, why agree to do it? Um, well, when you and I met in Malta and, you know, you're friends with people that I know and respect like James and others, and um, I had never actually listened to your podcast before, but I've got a couple, a couple episodes under my belt. And I think, um, you know, you, you do, you ask interesting questions and it's, and it's thoughtful and, you know, I do do a lot of these things and some of them I can do in my sleep because it's the same questions over and over again. But this one I haven't been able to do. I've had to kind of really give it some thought. So I think um, it's entertaining. It's interesting. And I like meeting interesting people, and so I've, I've enjoyed myself. Oh, well, thank you. Um, can we talk about um, this question that James Somaru suggested, which um, I've got written down. So he, he, I was speaking to him, and I had my notes open on my phone, and it just says, um, ask Jason about his theory, which explains just about absolutely everything, including how the market downturn affects health slash life sciences startups. Um, so tough question. <laughs> no but... pressure. What is the meaning of life? Thanks, <laughs> thanks guys. Um <laughs> I think it resulted from a conversation that he and I were having about kind of the macro environment currently. So we're, you know, January 2023, um, last year, 2022 was incredibly tough kind of coming off of the highs of 2021 where, um, because of, I think COVID and other things, health became extremely popular thesis of, you know, everyone who wasn't, uh, every general and generalist investor who wasn't focused in healthcare is like, Ooh, healthcare, we should, we should look at that and like, let's run over there and deploy some capital. Um, and so we had, you know, if you look at the kind of numbers of 2020 were record and then 2021 was an anomaly. And then now actually 2022 wasn't that far off of 20. I think they were pretty even. Um, but there was a lot of tourists, uh, you know, general investors came into healthcare, valuations got pumped up. Almost any idea could be funded. Lots of bad ones got funded. Uh, last year, we started to see a little bit of the, the bubble deflating and it's still, there's still a lot of pain out there right now. I think it's incredibly hard to raise. Uh, we were very lucky at Ori. We uh, closed our Series B in January last year, right as the kind of peak or the kind of inflection point was reached. But I think it's incredibly hard to raise. And I think, you know, health tech in particular, in my view, is a specialist area. I don't think you should have generalists sort of touring their way through healthcare. It's extremely difficult and extremely unusual as a market because the normal laws of supply and demand don't really apply in healthcare. Um, so I think, you know, for 2023, it's going to continue to be tough probably until the back half, hopefully in an interest, uh, in an environment where interest rates are increasing or being raised, um, uh, long dated assets like biotech or healthcare, um, often are seen as too risky. You know, how do I, how do I value revenues that may come in 10 years or 15 years? How do I can't really get my head, head around that. And, you know, the, the, discounted cash flow rates are increasing because interest rates are going up. So we're thinking about, you know, investors are saying, that seems a little bit too risky for me. Maybe I'll go for something that's a little bit more near term that I can value more easily. Uh, but the hope is that, you know, interest rates start to stabilize, maybe back half of 23. Again, if I knew the answer to this question, I'd be a hedge fund trader, not a startup CEO. But that's the kind of general consensus that I've read is that hopefully interest rates starts to stabilize end of this year. Hopefully then public markets start to stabilize uh, and then you'll start to see private market investing uh, really sort of come back to, to full swing because ultimately what investors are trying to do now, they have lots of capital. So they raised lots of money last year and the year before. And I've talked to investors, I was two weeks ago, I was at JP Morgan, the healthcare conference in San Francisco. And I'd talked to some investors who hadn't invested in any new companies in six months. So they just said, we're not investing in anything new because they can't price risk. They don't really know where fair value is. And so you know, for companies that raised in 2020 and 2021, they were maybe artificially inflated and we're trying to figure out like, where is the right value now? 
Uh, and so once that kind of stabilization happens, potentially some, it will unlock some of that dry powder, as they call it. And that will allow us to get back to sort of investing in and growing and, and uh, businesses and healthcare. The other thing I would say is that, you know, that's probably the, through the end of you know, of 24, um, before that actually the IPO market opens up again, up again for, for biotech and health tech. But even so, it's, it's, we, there aren't that many examples of really successful health tech businesses. So biotech is kind of its own animal, creating therapeutics. There's a whole investment model around that. But everything else uh, that we might lump into the health tech bucket, you know, SaaS businesses or enabling technologies or, you know, um, platforms that might do home monitoring or, you know, so the Babylons of the world and other, other companies. There's a few that you might consider to be successes might have considered to be successes. They got out on the public markets. Maybe they moved to the U.S. Um, from here. Every U.K. founder I've ever talked to uh, wanted to go to the U.S. and open their business there because that's the biggest healthcare market in the world. Uh, but then they've suffered greatly in the public markets, and you know, a lot of their stock prices are down 90%. So who do we point to? You know, who are the who are the analogs? Who are the people who say, you know what, they did it right. I'm going to do what they did, or I'm going to follow that lead. There's very, very few of them. Even in the U.S., there's not that many. So I don't really think we figured out the business model for health tech. Like, what does it really have to do? How do we really create value? Um, there was a perception of value um, during the kind of bubble, but that value has proved to be fleeting. So I'm super interested to see how the next, you know, let's say two years plays out and what kind, you know, there'll be a rationalization of, of you know, there'll be a lot of companies that fail because they can't raise. They might have good technology, but they just can't raise because of the environment. So survival is a strategy over the next two years, like just actually pulling your, you know, going turtle and pulling your, your head in and surviving. But it'll be really interesting to see what companies survive and, and, you know, you'll see new leaders emerging out of this downturn in the health tech space and maybe new models, you know, some new models that, that might work better than the old ones that we knew about. So it's a super interesting time to be here. And I think if we survive this, we'll come out stronger the other side. You said that health and health tech and maybe you were including life sciences, is a very different market and the normal laws of supply and demand don't apply. Um, can you explain to me, because um, I'd imagine in, in my head, health would be quite similar to other like highly regulated, high, high stakes industries like finance as well. So what, what, what are the kind of the, what makes it so unique and difficult? So the way I've thought about it and it may, may resonate, I don't know, but it's sort of the, the, the receiver of the benefit and the payer for the service are often different people or different organizations um, or are removed by several layers. So particularly in the UK and in, in uh, socialized healthcare systems like Europe, you have healthcare as a right. It's not a business. It's something that the government owes us. You know, the NHS is a highly politicized entity um, because of that reason. It's sort of it's paid for by our tax dollars and we expect it to be free and we expect it to be unlimited. Um, coming from the US where healthcare is a business, uh, it's a very different perspective. We're in the U.S. You're used to paying for things, so every time you go to the doctor, you pay a copay. So it's going to cost me twenty quid, or twenty percent of the cost of, for a, a medication or whatever it is. And it's part of the ethos of U.S. healthcare to pay for things. Uh, and so when you're looking to try and bring innovation in, you have to figure out who's going to pay for it. And it's extremely difficult in the U.K. at least to get the NHS to pay for anything, right? So we always say doctors can say no, but they can't say yes. So they can say, great, I'd like to try your technology. Let's do a pilot. That sounds great. Here's some data. But then if you ask them, well, will you, will you buy this? Can you be the customer? Like, oh, you got to go talk to procurement or talk to whoever the, writes the checks. So there's this, there's this disconnection between the people that enjoy the benefit, the people that pay for the service. And so that makes it fundamentally a little bit different than some of the other markets that are more direct. You know, SaaS was a, was a big model or is still is a big model and been proven to be, you know, one of the best business models out there, recurring revenue business models. But if you're buying, if you're selling software, it's relatively easy to develop. Let's just take, you know, Microsoft as an example. They turn their whole business from a one-off sale of a CD or a DVD, right, into a SaaS business. You have to pay every year now for Microsoft Office. What a giant pain in the butt. What a great business for them, though. Um, and Salesforce uh, invented that model. But it's, I'm getting the service. They're selling me software, and I'm sending them money. It's a very direct transaction. And so that's these kinds of things where there's different incentives in the system of, you know, what's the incentive of someone in the healthcare system in the UK, let's say, to innovate? You know, better better patient outcomes, great. Efficiencies, great. But who pays for those things? 
very few people. The NHS doesn't really pay for those things. They say they do, but they don't, you know, because they've got their priorities. And they'll say, well, these are our priority. You know, cardiovascular disease is our priority this year. Does this help with that? No, sorry, you're out. You know, go come back next year. So there's all these sort of weird and perverse incentives of we just want to keep our jobs. We want to keep our head down. We want to keep the thing ticking over. Uh, and you have to create a value proposition that is compelling enough, interesting enough for someone to stick their head up uh, above the parapet and to really take a risk. And that's not easy to do. So this, it's some of these reasons that are, you know, it's not just normally, you know, the the clearing price is where supply and demand meet. This doesn't doesn't always work that way in healthcare. It usually doesn't, actually. I want to try this uh, billion dollar health ideas segment. <laughs> um, so Jason, if tomorrow you were to start a new company in health, life sciences or biotech, uh, and it had it had to be a billion dollar company. Yeah. What what would you be what would you be doing? I've got two actually, um, so I'm excited about both of these, but I'm too old to do either. Um, so, one is health insurance. So health insurance is an absolutely rubbish market, right? So, the the quality is poor. The the offerings are generic. You know, no one pay, they, the shorthand is no one pays for prevention. No one actually pays for you to get healthy or be healthy. They just pay when you get sick. They'll pay for you to go to the doctor or pay for your prescription. So could you potentially provide, and there's a couple companies that I know that are kind of on the fringes of this. Oscar in the U.S. is one. There's a company called Life here in the U.K. that's doing some interesting things. It's how do you incentivize people to stay healthy? You know, it's super hard. Like we all know you shouldn't eat 10 McDonald's cheeseburgers, but we still do those things. We still eat too much. We still drink too much alcohol. We don't exercise enough. We sit on the couch too long. We know those things are not healthy for us, but we do them anyway. So figuring out a mechanism, you know, essentially all insurance is a risk sharing pool, right? So we pool our premiums together to say, well, if this person gets sick, we'll pay for that and we'll pay for this and we'll pay for this and we'll scrape some, some profit off the top and we'll leave the capital alone. That's essentially all insurance is. But if we can lower the incidence of those events where we have to pay out by actually investing in health and motivating people to stay healthy, go to the gym, you know, eat well, uh, make it easy for them so that they don't have to cook for themselves maybe. Or there's all these things that you could potentially do. I mean, again, I, as a marketer, I learned that I'm not the target market. You know, what I think is a good idea is probably rubbish. Uh, I should go out and test it with people that are actually, you know, the, the target market. But I think, you know, if you could create a call it a wellness uh, plan that was essentially insurance, but it helped motivate people in all the ways that are you know, possible to motivate, you know, by making it easy, by making it fun, by, you know, lowering the cost of the bad, uh, lowering the cost of the good things, increasing the cost of the bad things. Um, potentially there's a business model there that could be really powerful. Uh, and insurance is the best business ever. That's how uh, Warren Buffett made $120 billion or whatever he's made. So is because he's, um, he's very good at, He's very good at uh, at preventing businesses and, you know, this kind of investing the float of these insurance companies in, in smart things. So that's that's one big billion, at least that's a $10 billion idea, I think. But anyway. What, what, do, what do you think of these companies that are kind of doing like a health black box? Like, you know, you've got those black boxes in your in your cars that kind of track what you're doing yes. and then give you, incentivize you based on discounts and higher prices. I think Vitality in the UK is kind of doing that. Um, what do you make of that? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's probably a tactic that's probably a way to help because obviously it, what you're trying to do with insurance is price risk if you're riskier than i am they're going to charge you more than they charge me that's the optimal way and you could do that dynamically the way i mean life insurance is a great example of this because it's so ridiculous the way they do it right so when you buy insurance they send with someone to your house and they give you a physical basically and they say okay do, do you have high blood pressure you know how do you eat and whatever and when i was whatever i was when i first bought life insurance 35 you know, they price me at risk, the, the level of risk I am then for 20 years. You know, you have 20 year term life life insurance. Wouldn't it be better to actually dynamically price maybe once a year or multiple times a year to say, actually, if you're getting healthier, then you pay less. And if you're paying, getting unhealthier, you pay more. That seems like a very obvious uh, use case for some of those kinds of sensors and other technologies that exist. But people don't do it. They don't really do it. And, 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 you know, I think it's the, you need to have the financial incentive aligned uh, for both parties, the, you know, the policyholder, you and I, and the, and the company. I think it's a definitely a very, it would be a very good way to do it, uh, to sort of put this kind of risk pool together by dynamically monitoring the people involved. Um, but also then you might get selection bias, right? So younger people who are willing to be monitored, who are more 
uh, more comfortable with technology. There's all these other kind of aspects, but I think there's a business there somewhere. And let's see if you start it, I'll, I'll come join you and do my best to support you. Thank you. And what was the uh, second idea? Uh, the second idea is just, it's a little bit more boring, but I think it's um, it just has to be done, which is we all know that electronic medical records are a nightmare. You know, they're antiquated, locally installed. You know, the vast majority of, uh, the last number of statistic I saw, and I don't know if it's still current, was 60%, 60% of the health records in the UK were still on paper. Now, I find that extremely hard to believe, but I'm afraid that it might be it might be right. I also saw uh, a statistic that said that the, the UK uh, National Health Service is the number one purchaser of a certain technology. Do you know what that technology is? Um, no. Fax machines. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's a ways to go uh, in healthcare and how do we really, so we, we wasted a ton of money on an insure operability project, I believe, in the UK, which is a big kind of financial boondoggle, and, but no country's gotten this right. Um, the U.S. doesn't have it right. There's some big players, but if we could actually link together the sources of data for an individual patient so that you can track them through their whole health journey, it would be incredible. The, the, the things we could do with that data, the, the wellness we could provide, the information and data we could provide uh, would be incredible. Uh, but I think it would take having to rip out the whole system and start over, uh, which no one's willing to do because it's way too painful and way too expensive. Uh, but I think that's that's a that's a hundred billion dollar idea if it, if we could get it to work. But right now we just put patches on various pieces. So there's various data pieces here and there, and we try and hook them together. But they work. Sometimes they're bidirectional. Sometimes they go one way. Sometimes you can't see this one, but you can see that one. There's all kinds of a mess uh, because we've got these legacy systems. I think we're just gonna have to rip it out and start over. But it's a massive opportunity, I think. The interesting plays I've seen in this is that there's the play where you treat it like a utility and there's some kind of central authority that either creates or commissions the uh, making of an uh, EHR mm -hmm. system. Uh, then there's the kind of hybrid approach where someone like Epic or Cerner comes in and, 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 you use, and you just kind of agree to use them across everything. And then the new play I'm seeing, which I think is interesting, is kind of like the, uh, you know, Apple Health, where um, the, the key difference I think there is that truly the patient or the customer actually owns their yeah. health records. Like they are... I mean, we say that's the case with uh, these um, systems we have currently from the government side, but really it's not. But in in this case, you literally, I mean, it's on your phone, it's yours and you can choose yeah. how to share it. So I wonder who will come out on top or which approach will, will, will come out. So I had read about an effort in Australia where they have pulled all of the patient health records together in one place and you had to opt out to if you didn't want it put into the system or shared or whatever. And as we know, people are generally lazy, so only about 5% of people opted out. If you asked people to opt in, it would have been you know 5% of people that opted in. Um, and that now they have access to aggregated patient records over time that are centrally controlled in a, obviously a secure database by the government. Now, we could argue that's overreached by the government, um, but I think for it to happen, that's the kind of effort that's going to need to be. You need to put that infrastructure in place and get people used to that infrastructure and show everybody that it's safe and you're not going to be plastering my medical history on a billboard. Um, but I think if you can go that that direction, I just can't see another way. And this would never happen in the U.S. There'd be anarchy and people would be like, you know, waving their guns from the top of buildings. But I think in, in uh, social economies where there's a national health service where you already have that health care provision by the state and that's expected this is possible. I think it's probably has to be government led. I don't know how it's going to work otherwise, because otherwise you have to have ultimate, I mean, how do I, how would I get into my Apple, you know, health app, the information when I just went to the pharmacy or I just went to the, you know, doc in a box or I just went to get my COVID jab. And, you know, it's, it's just, it seems incredibly hard to have those pieces all work together unless they're operating off the same system. And I can't, I can't really understand how that could be a patient, owned system you know you can control potentially access you can control the doorway but you can't control the the root sort of database or the source it doesn't really work i don't think from a crowdsourcing perspective i wanted to talk a little bit about money and making it because this is my favorite topic <laughs> I think. and um so the questions were essentially and feel free to riff off these a bit but it's have you made it how does life change once you make it 
and then just your general thoughts um either from your personal experience or i'm guessing your your pals with a lot of people who've done the same as you worse than you better off than you and just the kind of your general take on does money buy happiness uh even if you could i'd be really interested if you put a figure on it actually if you thought there's like hmm, once you hit this level of money you're pretty you're pretty set like it's not going to get you anymore like this is where the diminishing returns um start so w- what do you think uh i haven't reached it whatever the number is um i think uh no there is some there's a fair amount of research out there i think as well on this topic but i think for me personally happiness is expectations minus reality right happiness equals expectations minus reality it's sort of like we have to keep our expectations in check and if we look at the you know our next door neighbor who owns a tesla or you know has this massive house or it's a way to kind of just immediately breed dissatisfaction so i think it, it it is relative you know certainly people who don't have enough money for subsistence for a roof over the head for food these are this is clearly not an acceptable situation but i think beyond that how much is enough is relative to your expectations and you know what you need so i think for me i'm looking to no longer have to work um within the next eight or nine years so i'm just turned 48 so mid fifties would be ideal because I've got other things that I want to do besides work every day for a paycheck that, you know, pays the bills. And that's my success. That's my criteria. Um, there's a number there that I feel like will, you know, my financial advisor tells me will be, will be enough to, to last me till my nineties. And then if I'm 95 and run out of money, then I'm screwed. But anyway, um, so I think, you know, that's, and, and, you know, for some people that's, a million bucks or a million pounds and for other people it's five million and for some people it's 10 million or you know you need to get to a certain threshold where you can you know give to charity you can travel you can make sure your kids are put through college there's you know things that you need to do Um, but that number is different for everyone i think and so you know it's hard to put a single number on it for, for every person i've met a lot of people that don't have a huge amount of means but seem incredibly happy with their situation you know their happiness is their expectations were uh, exceeded by reality, whatever that was. So that's what I'd argue. I and mean, I think the numbers get in the way that the money that people make on, you know, being a YouTube influencer, I think is obscene, but you know, who am I? Who am I to judge? Uh, I also think professional athletes we make too much money for what they do. But again, who am I to judge? That's what the market dictates. And I think teachers and nurses and doctors, certainly in the UK, don't make enough money. But again, I don't make the rules. So it's sort of, how do we find enough for ourselves and, and, uh, for our goals and what we want to do. And I'm close, I'm close. I'm, I'm eight, eight to 10 years away. Um, so that's, that's exciting to think about. I don't have to work till I'm 69 and a half or whatever the retirement age is in the U S like fingers crossed. I'll be, I'll do a little bit better than that. Last question. Uh, we've kind of discussed it throughout, but, um, have there been any habits or ways you approach problems, ways you think that you think of helped you get to where you are today? I think I'm generally a positive person. I see the my old company had some great, um, they called them guiding principles. Uh, one of them was believe that others' actions are well-intended, uh, which I really like as a kind of a, a principle for life, if you will. You know, we've all been in the situation where you receive some kind of short, terse email. Usually it's without the accompanying body language or, or tonality. So you're getting just the words. And you're like, well, that wasn't, that was kind of a cold prickly. That wasn't, that wasn't very nice. Um, and then you realize, well, the person was like dashing for a bus or, you know, whatever had just, you know, found out someone was sick or or whatever it is. There's all kinds of extenuating circumstances. And I think generally I try and believe that others' actions are well-intended. I think people generally are nice. People are generally helpful. Uh, I try and be those things. Um, And I think if you look at life through that lens, oftentimes that will be true, you know, and, and the contrary perhaps could also be true. One of my favorite quotes it's by a guy called Charles Swindoll, and he, he he said a quote about attitude. Basically, the, the paraphrasing to say that life is effectively 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so we are in control of our attitude. We can't be in control of what happens to us at all the times, but your attitude can make or break a family, a relationship, a, a church, a home, a business, because it's what you bring. It's the attitude you bring. Uh, to the situation. It's not necessarily the situation that makes a difference. So some of those things I try and live by. I hope you enjoyed that episode. You can find all my links by going to bigpicturemedicine.co.uk. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, then please consider leaving a review. By the way, 
all of these episodes are now available on Spotify and on YouTube in video format. Thanks for listening.